uh, I think that the startup form is one of the most incredible ways to make positive change on the planet. It's an incredible organizational schema to get people together to rally and have equity stake and do very important things. So I want to try and share with you some of the things I've learned about the startup form, some of the things that I think matter most for success, how to iterate ideas to get to success, and I hope some of these things will translate to the efforts that you have. Uh, First, I want to give you a little background on my startup history to see the context from where these ideas come from. I've been starting businesses all my life. Uh, my very, very first business was selling candy at the bus stop in junior high school. I was 12 years old, and uh, candy bars at the student store were 10 cents, and I saw them on sale at Save On Drug Store in Encino, California, where I grew up, for three for a quarter. So I bought candy bars, three for a quarter, eight and a third cents each, and undercut the bookstore by a whole penny. I sold them for nine cents at the bus stop. And this was my little Pan Am bag that I filled with candy bars, took to the bus stop. And over the three years of junior high school, I made a whopping $400 of profit selling candy bars at two-thirds of a cent markup. But it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about what kind of candy bars people liked, uh, uh, listening to the customer, um, uh, figuring out exactly where I could buy the candy bars cheaper. And it was a really, really valuable experience for me. It turned out I, I, I also took wood shop and metal shop in junior high school and fell in love with making things with my hands. And I used that $400 profit to buy some woodworking tools and started making things and selling them at the Rose Bowl swap meet. When I got to high school, my second business was started. It was 1973, and I don't know how many of you remember the Arab oil embargo. In California especially, it was hit hard. You only could buy $5 of gasoline per day on odd and even number of days based on the last digit of your license plate. So there were long lines of cars lined up outside all the gas stations in Studio City. And I thought, there's got to be some way to solve this problem of this energy crisis, and of course, being 15 years old and just having taken trigonometry, I thought I could use my math skills from how to make parabolas to try and make solar energy concentrators, things like that. So I started making some, and um, I was not solving the energy crisis, but I was reading Popular Science Magazine. I took out a little ad in the back of Popular Science Magazine. I remember having to get my mother to write a check for me, a $39 check for this little classified ad. And I sold plans and kits in the back of Popular Science Magazine where I would go duplicate those plans at Kinko's and sell them for $4. So it cost me probably 40 cents. I'd sell them for $4. And that was my first taste. It was a very powerful taste of intellectual property. Now I wasn't selling candy bars for two-thirds of a cent markup. I was selling ideas from my head for 90% markup. It was very, very intoxicating. And I sold about 10,000 plans over the next few years in high school at $4 each. And it helped me pay my way through college. And in fact, um, I, I went to Caltech after that. And it might have even helped me get accepted to Caltech, because I wrote about that on my application. And um, I was very, very thrilled to go to Caltech, where I then fell in love with my third business, um, loudspeaker design. Uh, when I got to college, uh, the seniors there had these incredible audio systems, which I couldn't afford. But someone said, well, you can go take classes and learn how to make those. And I took some audio engineering classes, and I started making some loudspeaker designs. Uh, Caltech actually, actually helped me get a patent on these loudspeaker designs. And I started selling these to people on campus and off campus. And the year I graduated from Caltech, 1981, was the year the IBM PC came out. And that was a real, real big moment for me to go buy my IBM PC for $5,000 of savings at Computerland in Pasadena. And it, I remember that time. It had 64K of RAM and one floppy, one 360K floppy drive and a monochrome screen. But it was unbelievable the innovation that could happen now, because now you could use your intellectual property and you could do anything you wanted. Uh, it's a term I'll talk about later in my talk, what I call permissionless innovation. You didn't need to go ask anybody to do what you wanted to on this IBM PC. You could just buy one and make anything you wanted. There was no central authority limiting what you could do. And that's what's been so exciting about the innovation platform since then. So I bought this IBM PC. I started making products that work with Lotus 123. I made it uh, CPA Plus. It was an um, add-in for 123 that helped me do my accounting for my business. And I made this product that was a natural language interface for Lotus 123 that I called HAL. And then Lotus acquired the company. So I was 25 years old. Lotus acquired this company for $10 million. It was a wild, wild success for me. I'd never seen anything like that before. I never had a company get acquired, never built a business like that. And I moved to Cambridge with my brother. My brother had joined me in this company and started working for Lotus. I had signed a one-year contract for Lotus, and I learned everything I could about the software business from Lotus. And at the end of one year, they renewed my contract. At the end of the second year, they renewed my contract. I stayed there for six and a half years. I had a really, really great time at Lotus learning everything about the software industry. And I stayed there until 1991, and in 1991, that was when my youngest son, at the time, five years old, now he's 28, David, um, started kindergarten. And I remember waving goodbye to him on the playground that very first day of school, 
wondering, is he going to have that amazing fourth grade teacher that I had that made me fall in love with learning? And I was worried he wasn't going to. So I wanted to make software that would help him fall in love with learning, and not just him, his whole generation, all his friends and everything, because what if he fell in love with learning, but that wasn't cool? I wanted it to be cool for him and his friends. So I started this company, Knowledge Venture. And that's where I first ran into Jeff, because I ended up working with Random House. We started making products called Knowledge Venture. We made a product um, called Undersea Adventure, Dinosaur Adventure, Space Adventure. We eventually made a product called Jumpstart Kindergarten. And we made Jumpstart Kindergarten and a whole elementary series of products. And those took off. We ended up selling 20 million copies of those CD-ROM products. And we sold that company for $90 million in 1995. And that's when I started Idea Lab. I really saw the internet taking off. It was 1995. Uh, Netscape had just gone public. Netscape, ironically, went public on my birthday, August 9th in 1995. Uh, Netscape now had 30 million users. And I remember at Knowledge Venture, I wanted to <coughs> contact our customers to try and learn more how to make our products better. But we didn't know who our customers were. We made our product. We sold them to a distributor. They sold them to a reseller. They sold them to a retailer. And then the retailer sold them to an end customer. And we didn't know their names. Egghead knew their names, or Walmart knew their names, or CompUSA knew their names. And sometimes they didn't even know their names because the person just buying at the counter anonymously. It was a, a great liberating feeling to think, if you made something that worked on the internet, you could talk to your customers directly. You could hear from them directly. So I was so excited about that. And I had many, many different ideas for companies to start. And that's why I started Idealab, specifically as a technology incubator. I didn't know it would work, if it would work or not. We raised enough money to run for one year. We raised $3.5 million. Um, uh, $500,000 that I invested, $500,000 from six other investors. It was specifically to have a one-year budget to run a million dollars for 10 people and to do 10 $250,000 experiments. We would invest in 10 companies and see if we could make those work. And we were looking for ideas uh, all over. Basically, I was looking for things that I felt I wanted online. I remember the online times in 1995, 1996. It was a frontier. But also, there was a lot of worry about whether people would even put their credit cards online. A lot of people were worried about where it was even going to head. And uh, we built this, this facility to have shared resources for all the companies, very much like what you have here. Lots of shared resources so you can innovate and try things in different areas. And the very first few ideas I had were these. We started them. And at the end of one year, five of them had gone out of business, but seven of them had received from some additional funding. We put in the first $250,000. We found CEOs and management teams to lead them. At the end of one year, we had made enough progress to get enough money raised to do a second year. At the end of the second year, a few of those companies had their first IPOs, and then we used that funding to continually fuel Idealab and make it self-sufficient since then. And since then, We've done more than 100 companies. As Jeff said, it's 125 companies now across many, many different industries, including robotics, internet companies, e-commerce companies, even solar energy companies. <clears throat> Anywhere we can look in the world and see where there's a big problem that technology could solve, we try and make a company around it. We're often limited by whether we can find talented people. We fail for many, many other reasons. I'm going to try and share with you some of the reasons that we failed, because we learned a lot of lessons from those failures. But across these 125 companies, we've helped the companies among all of them raised more than $3.5 billion. We had 45 successful IPOs and acquisitions out of that 125. We had seven of them that reached more than a billion dollar valuation. We have 30 current operating companies, so we've experienced more than 50 failures. So we learned a lot from those failures. And I'll try and share some of this experience with, the, with you. But the thing I'm most proud of, we created more than 10,000 jobs across all those companies, most of them in Pasadena, some of them now in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and, and in Santa Monica. We have some new companies that are starting in New York. We're now location agnostic, and we want to start companies wherever the talent is. So we take the ideas that we have, we put in the seed capital, and then we want to go wherever the people are. So now, across all that experience, what have I found most makes a startup successful? And I recently, um, actually at, at David Kirkpatrick's conference, I heard Peter Thiel speak, but I also read, read his book. Uh, he has some really, really interesting provocative ideas um, about going from zero to one and how much value is created when you take a new idea that's fresh and then put it in place, as compared to going from one to n, which is scaling up an existing idea that already works. I do agree with him. I think a huge amount of value creation goes when you see something that no one's tried before and then make it take effect. And uh, there's no simple formula for that. And he says in his book, too, uh, as an example, the next Bill Gates is not going to be making an operating system. The next Larry Page won't be making a search engine. The next Mark Zuckerberg won't be making a social network. The next great thing is going to be something completely new. It's going to be innovation that's, that's fresh and completely clean. 
So if there's no formula for that, what can I tell you that still would be useful since there's no formula for making that next big break? Well, I want to try and share with you what I've looked at over the years, looking back at our companies and other companies, what ends up mattering most. So I took a look at some of the standard elements that people talk about leading to success. The idea, the team, the business model, the funding, the timing. In fact, I always used to think the idea mattered the most. Uh, and I took a look at these, and I'll look at these in more detail. So these five areas, idea, team, business model, funding, and timing. Let me talk about each of them. So first on the idea. There's the novelty and differentiation of the idea. It's how new is it, how much of it has not been done before. How much truth is there in the idea that no one else has seen before? And let me give you an example of what I mean by a truth. But let's, say, let's take Airbnb as an example of a company with an interesting new truth. Their truth was people would be willing to rent out a room of their house or their whole house to a complete stranger. Now, when that truth was first talked about with others, most people laughed at that. In fact, notably, I think Fred Wilson, a great VC here in New York, passed on that idea because that was just too outrageous. But in fact, it did turn out to be true. So moving the idea from being outrageous to actually proving that it was true, a huge amount of value was created. Well, I think that's an example of an idea truth. Now, that idea also had been tried before, but wasn't tried exactly the way they tried it. Another example of, of uh, idea com com is competitive differentiation or competitive moats. Are there things you can build around your idea to protect other people from copying it? OK, now to team and execution. And I'm going to tell you how I score all of these in a moment, but I'm just summarizing them first. When I look back at our companies, I often see some teams that were really, really effective. We once had a McKinsey CEO, an ex-McKinsey per person who was a CEO of one of our companies, and he was just very, very effective. He just really got things done. He plowed through barriers. Uh, also, adaptability was another factor we saw in various of our teams. How much did they listen to new information? How much did they change in the light of new customer data? On the business model, some of our companies had a very clear path to profitability, very clear path to revenues. Some of them didn't. On the funding, some of our companies were able to raise a lot of money, and some of them weren't. And on timing, some companies we had were way too early, some companies were early, and some companies were too late. So I tried to assess all of these things. And what I did is I looked at 200 companies. I looked at 100 of ours and 100 of other people companies. And I took a look at 10 outliers in each set. 10 companies of ours, five that turned out to be wild successes, worth more than a billion dollars, and five that we thought were going to be worth more than a billion dollars but failed. And then the same thing for 100 other companies. We looked at 10, that, 10 companies in particular, five that turned out to be wild successes that people didn't think were going to be wild successes, and five that turned out to be failures but people thought were going to be wild successes. And I came to this conclusion. Here's looking across these, these 10 companies from Idea Lab and looking across these 10 companies from outside of Idea Lab. I'll come back to this in a moment. And here was the summary. Timing actually mattered the most. I was completely shocked to discover this. This is completely subjective. It's my own, my own look at companies and my own evaluation. But let me at least tell you why I came to this conclusion. Timing mattered the most. Team and execution mattered second. The idea was actually third. The thing that I used to think was the most important thing. I mean, heck, I named it Idea Lab because I thought it was all about ideas. I thought the idea was everything. And in fact, it wasn't the most important thing. Business model was, was uh, uh, fourth. And funding was the least of the top five. Uh, and now let me try and uh, explain these. So funding mattered the least, I think, because if you have a good idea, as long as you have enough money to get it out there, and if you find product market fit and find traction, you will find a way to get more money and get there, or you'll find a way to last if you have adaptability. So funding was the least important variable. It's also, in these times today, by the way, 2014 compared to 1995, 1996, or the other companies I started, when I raised money for Knowledge Venture in 1991, it was very hard to raise money. Today, funding is, is very, very easy to come by. There is so much money out there between angel investors and other investors. If you have an idea, funding is not the problem. To at least give your idea a try. It might be hard to get funding to scale, but that's probably if you're not achieving product market fit. Business model. The reason why business model came in second to last is because if you have traction, you can adapt a business model. You can add on a business model. Take Twitter as an example, or even Facebook. Facebook early on, people laughed at it because they thought there's no way it's going to have a business model. It's making billions of dollars of revenue now because it's got trillions of page views and so much valuable insights on, on its users. So business model can be added afterwards. You don't have to have a business model at first. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't help to have one. That's not saying that you shouldn't have some of that thought in mind, but it, I just think it's much, much lower important. Next comes the idea. If you can still come up with an idea that really resonates with customers, and in fact, if you don't, you won't succeed, but it's not the single most important thing. Uh, I think it's very valuable to try and look for things that are, you're very passionate about. And I'll talk more about that later, because I think that's necessary for success as well. 
but I don't think it's a, the most important thing. The idea alone won't get you there. And in particular, when I look back at our own companies and other, idea, other companies, sometimes the idea had been tried before and didn't work, but then it was tried again and it worked. And I was trying to figure out, was it timing or execution? And that's why I concluded timing actually mattered more. Execution matters so much more than even the idea because, and this is, it's kind of funny that I would even be quoting Mike Tyson in an article on, uh, to talk about innovation, but Mike Tyson had a great line about, um, uh, about fighting, which I think actually applies to this, which is um, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And, and uh, <laughs> I, I think it is like that in business. You have this whole plan. In fact, I remember when I used to start companies, everything was about writing the perfect business plan and coming up with a business plan and having all the details and planning out five years and all that. And I learned what a joke that was because basically, your first interaction cu with customers is like getting punched in the face. The customer straightens out everything and changes all your plans because they have their own ideas. You've got your idea, but they have their ideas about how to use your product or what they want. And that's why I think the team and execution adaptability matters so much because when you first get punched, you have to re recoil from that punch and respond to it and listen to it and, and pay attention to it and then adjust your business after it. And that's why I think that, that's the aspect of the team that I think matters so much. But now timing. Why did I put timing first? Well, so many ideas need to be executed in their right time. I look back at companies that we had that they failed, and almost always, except for team and execution, they failed because we tried them way too early. The world wasn't ready for them yet. Um, or we were too late, meaning there were too many competitors already. So timing is, is a little bit of luck, but it's not only luck. You can actually look at the market and see if the world is ready for what you're making. And let me try and give you some advice on how to evaluate that and use that as a judgment factor in making decisions on a company. In fact, I'll go to the Airbnb example first, and I'll give some of my own examples too. The Airbnb example, many companies had made places where you could rent other people's homes before. Airbnb, the, the guys also made this product out of need. I don't know if you know the story about the Airbnb founders, but they were in San Francisco. They were from Rhode Island School of Design. They were, there was a conference in town, a design conference. The city was sold out, and they decided to make some, they were broke. They uh, made some extra money just by inflating an air mattress in their apartment and renting it out to people who couldn't get rooms who were coming in town from, I think, Rhode Island for the conference. And um, why, that it was very clever. It was, it was born out of immediate need, but the timing was incredible because it was just as the huge recession was hitting. So this idea, which might have been tried many times but didn't work, the timing was incredible because people needed extra money very badly. So people were actually willing to rent out their homes in a way they might not have been just a few years earlier or even maybe four years later. So timing was actually a big factor in that company's success, not only the idea. And I look back on one of our companies. We started a company called Z.com uh, in 1999. It was, we saw all the companies that were happening on the internet and we thought, well, right here, we were right in Los Angeles, so we're right in Hollywood. Um, we thought entertainment was going to move online. In fact, video form entertainment. So we started a company, we put in $250,000 called Z.com. We raised a million dollars and built an entertainment team to try and make uh, short form online video entertainment content. It was maybe a forerunner to YouTube. And then we even raised $10 million, built up a team of 100 people, and started signing comedians to exclusive contracts. In fact, I, I came to New York, and I actually remember this was a hysterical meeting, me sitting in a room with Chris Rock, trying to close him on being an exclusive provider of content to this little website, z.com. He barely knew what the internet was. And I closed him. I gave him 5% equity and a million dollars for a five-year exclusive to everything Chris Rock did online. Uh, I signed Adam Sandler in a trailer at Descanso Gardens when he was filming a movie. Uh, we signed a whole bunch of great people. We signed four of our $10 million for exclusive content. We started making this content. People were downloading it and loved it. But there was only about 10% broadband penetration in 2000. To watch a video online, you had to do all this kludgy stuff to download codecs and plug in these weird things to watch video. So we had this great stuff that nobody could watch. We, we eventually were losing money. And in 2002, we reduced the company down to 45 people. In 2003, we reduced the company down to 11 people. Then at the end of 2003, we went out of business. And in 2004, Adobe comes out with their flash plug-in video player. And the flip cam comes out, and everybody starts making a whole bunch of videos with their USB stick. And then two guys come and say, hey, we should make a website where people can share videos since now they're easy to view. Broadband penetration had reached 40%, and then YouTube was born. I'm not saying that the YouTube guys didn't execute brilliantly. They got Sequoia's investors and raised a lot of money. They did a great, great job. But timing was incredible. We really blew that company by not sticking around until the timing was right. And we should have looked at the signals. We should have looked at the slow broadband penetration rate, slow growth, and, and survived until the elbow occurred in the, in the ramp of, of that curve. So we could have looked more smartly 
at what the other signals were telling us. People loved what we were making, but they just couldn't watch it. And sometimes you can't control all the external variables in the new thing you're making. And you have to be very honest with yourself about what the rest of the world is telling you on, on the timing front. So that timing thing came, on, came up over and over again with the companies I looked at. And even Facebook's timing was incredible. Friendster was out before Sp Facebook. Sp MySpace was out before Facebook. Now, Facebook had incredible execution. I actually scored Facebook extremely high in execution because Mark Zuckerberg's incredible. And they brought in Sheryl Sandberg. But even that was later. But their execution strategy of rolling out college by college and, and so many things they did were beautiful. And execution, but their time was really, really perfect, as was some of other companies as well. So I do think that the reason why timing is actually somewhat liberating as a competitive advantage is that is where a small entrepreneur can actually out-execute a big company. A big company is often lazy and lubbering and has inertia, and that's where an individual can time something beautifully. Obviously, they can also have a brand new idea, where the idea is very powerful too, and they can be more adaptable. But the top three things, what's great about the top three things is those are the exact things that a small startup can beat a big company at. Big company has money and brand and existing customers and all that. So they have better funding. They probably already have a business model. It's the top three things that the big company is often hesitant to, to uh, obviously, the innovator's dilemma, interrupt their own revenue stream, but also really listen to the market as well as a small company can. So that, that's actually what's liberating about starting a company against a big competitor. So why do I think the opportunity is so big? And let me give you a few more examples of things that you can do to improve your odds of success. Permissionless innovation. It's what I said about the PC industry. I didn't understand that term back then. This is a term that Mark Andreessen talks about a lot. But obviously, the, the internet revolution that caused that, the Bitcoin revolution is causing that. I'll talk about that in a second. The mobile revolution, uh, the mobile revolution is just incredible. So, so when I go, the, the way you can reach the whole planet now. Um, when, when I started um, uh, Knowledge Adventure, well, look, look at the evolution of my own uh, personal career. So I started selling candy at the bus stop. My reach was a three block radius and 100 kids. Uh, then I um, started selling uh, mail order plans, and now I can reach the, the um, you know, quarter million subscribers of uh, P uh, Popular Science Magazine or Scientific American Magazine. Um, uh, then uh, I worked in the packaged goods, industry, packaged goods software industry, and then I can reach the people who would walk into software stores. And then I was intoxicated by the 30 million Netscape users that were all over the world. 30, there was 50 million internet users in 1995. 30 million of them were on Netscape. So 60% of the entire addressable audience was uh, using this one browser. And if you made a product that worked in that browser, you could talk to those people. And now with the mobile revolution, there's 2 billion people connected with a smartphone, with 1 billion new smartphones being sold in the next year. There'll be 4 billion in two years. More than half the planet will be connected with an always-on supercomputer in their pocket in two years. So it's just incredible that you can talk to all those. So, so with just 2 billion today, compared to the 50 million uh, internet users uh, when I started Idealab, it's 40x the market, 40x. So it doesn't mean that you can, um, uh, all those people will be your customers. You have to come up with something clever and innovative to reach them. But it means that it's possible, that you don't have the barriers. Like I think back to Knowledge Venture, all those distributors I had to convince, and those retailers, and all those bottlenecks. Now, if you have an idea, and especially in journalism, you, you have an idea, and you want to talk to the planet, you can reach the whole planet, or half the planet, you know, the, 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 uh, the people with smartphones in a few years. So that is just an amazing, amazing possibility. And when I look back on these last three revolutions, the PC revolution, the HTML revolution, the blockchain revolution, uh, what's incredible about these three things is they're all underlying protocols. They're just protocols that someone invented that then took off enough to get adopted so that billions of people will use them. And then there's no one controlling them. There's no one controlling the PC platform or now the, you know, the, 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 uh, new, the new platforms that are available to you. There's no one controlling the HTML platform, blocking you from making something for it. There's no one controlling the blockchain, so you can't innovate with payments or all kinds of things on top of it. And that's why I say permissionless, permissionless innovation is why so many things can grow big so fast. And if you look back at other things, uh, when I say mobile everywhere, you look back at other things and their growth rates. So, so it took basically 40 years for the computer to grow to 350 million PCs per year being sold, and it's leveling off at 350 million. It took a few years for the smartphone to get to 500 million a year and now a billion a year. So it's, it's faster than anything else has ever taken off in history. So we're part of that revolution with the smartphone. And the tablet is taking off too, but at a much lower rate than, than the smartphone. And Look at, what that's, look at what that's enabled. And I'm not saying making a billion dollar company is the end goal. I, uh, to me, the end goal is making a positive impact on the world. 
but sometimes this is a measure of how fast you could have a reach. It used to take 20 years for a Fortune 500 company to reach a billion dollar valuation. It took Google eight, it took Facebook six, it took Tesla four, it took WhatsApp two, and it took Waze one and a half. So one and a half years to go from zero to a billion dollars of, of, of valuation impact. So, and, and Waze, some guys in Israel were able to come up with an idea that could touch the whole planet. They could talk to all those smartphones and they could have that big of an impact that fast. That applies to anything. If you make something that resonates with the mind of the customer, you can have that big impact. So now let's talk about resonating with the mind of the customer. So first, in coming up with ideas, uh, my best method, uh, the one I would recommend, but there's many, many methods, is look for ideas everywhere and especially things that matter to you personally. So here's why I think it's so important to find things that matter to you personally. It's because at every business I've started, even the, the, the most successful ones always had tough times. Knowledge Venture had very tough times. Um, uh, all of our successes had tough times. The only way to make it through those tough times, if it's something you're passionate about, it's the only way I think you're gonna be able to live to that next moment and find that new turn, f find that, that, that fork in the road to make the company successful. I also think it's important, if it matters to you personally, that you can be a good judge of the idea itself. Now, you can at least make sure that you love the product. It doesn't guarantee that other people want the same thing that you want, but I think there's a lot higher odds if at least you're a good judge. Um, I often have people come to me and say, what idea should I make? Um, and how should I judge if people, uh, like the focus groups, what, what method should I use? Well, I think if you have to rely on focus groups, it's very, very di difficult to make judgments on improving your product. You definitely want to listen to other people. I'm going to give you an example of that in a moment. But I don't think you can rely only on other people to help shape your product or your company. Second, test, test, test. So this was something I had ironically learned. This was big help to me. I didn't know it. I didn't know anything about the term lean startup or anything like that when I was 15 years old. But when I did my little mail order business in high school, I went to the library and I read, art, read books on direct mail and all they said was test, test, test. Test everything, test every, var every variable. Test your offer, test your proposition, test your product, test everything, try everything different. And I learned one small trick, you would never have to do this anymore. Uh, obviously that's what's so great about the internet, about, about um, having direct contact with your customers. But one of the things I learned in those books from the library in uh, downtown LA was, was um, on each of the little ads I would run in the back of Popular Science and Scientific American and Popular Mechanics Magazine, I would write a different address. They all, all the email, all the mail had to come to my house. But I would write A gross, B gross, C gross, D gross. So each, each um, uh, um, ad had a different uh, code that I could tell which ad they were answering. So I, was, I would keep track. I didn't have spreadsheets back then. There were no spreadsheets yet. Uh, uh, Dan Brooklyn hadn't come along. Bob Franks hadn't come along yet with VisiCalc. But I would keep little tabular things of which I even would test what color ink when I wrote back to the people. I would write some letters back in handwriting, some letters back typing. I would write some letters in calligraphy. I would find that if I would write in calligraphy, I'd get a much higher response rate because people think they were getting a wedding invitation in the mail so they would open it. <laughs> <laughs> but I would test everything. And uh, it's so valuable to do that. And now I, I carry that forward today in my businesses is just try and find out what matters to your customer by testing every, every different aspect of it. And Cars Direct was a perfect example of that. This was one of our companies that was a, a very big success. We started in 1998 and it has a classic testing story of uh, I had gone down to buy a new car in Glendale Auto Mall uh, near where I live and I had a terrible experience, the usual terrible experience, buying a car where I went in, I wanted to buy the car, I knew what kind of car I wanted, and then I told the guy, and he said, oh, well, we, we can't get that one. Uh, oh, that's not available. He goes in his computer and fake types and says, oh, that's not available anywhere in the area, because of course he doesn't want to get it from another dealer. He wants to sell you one that he has in the lot. And it does the whole runaround where I have to get the car without the features that I want and all that. And I left frustrated and said, boy, wouldn't it be great if you could just go to a website, type in the configuration you want, I'm willing to wait, I'll put $1,000 down, just have the car show up in a flatbed truck at my house and I'll pay the balance when it gets here. And I don't even care if I pay a little bit over invoice. I don't need the absolute best deal. I'd like a good deal, but I'll, I'm willing to wait. So uh, they can make a profit on me because they don't have to worry about holding the car in the lot anymore. Well, I wanted that. I didn't know if anybody else wanted that. And we wanted to find out if that was a worthwhile business. And we ran it by other people. A lot of people said, no, I wouldn't do that. No, I need to test drive it. I said, well, I think there's some people who don't need to test drive it. They know what kind of car they want. They've ridden in the car before. Someone else had the car, whatever. Let's just find out. Well, how can we find out easily? So we formed a company called Cars Direct. We were going to test this in only 90 days. Uh, rather than capitalizing with the whole $250,000, we just capitalized with $50,000 just to try the test. And we would invest the whole $250,000 if the test worked. If the test didn't work, we would stop. But nobody would lose, uh, uh, we'd only lose $50,000. That'd be the maximum of this test. 
So we hired a person to come run the test for us, and he was going to become CEO if we decided to go forward. He wasn't going to lose his job if the test didn't go forward. He was just going to work on some other project with us. So that was important, so there was no worry about him biasing the test or anything like that. He started working on it, and he started working on building out the website. And after about 20, 30 days, I met with him, and he said, well, I'm working on the website. I'm also talking to suppliers. I have a meeting with Ford, a meeting with Honda. I said, what are you talking to Ford and Honda for? This is why I got to be able to get the cars. He said, we're not, we're not going to actually have a relationship with the companies. We're just going to go down to the Monrovia Auto Mall and buy a car at retail and sell it at a loss to the customer. We'll lose $1,500 in the car, but we just need to find out if people want to do this. OK, OK, I'll stop talking to them. So then 30 days later, I met with them. OK, now I'm working on the configurator where people can choose the drop downs and choose their options in their car. It's a lot of work because I have to make sure all the options match up. The options, some options are not possible, like you can't get the seat heaters. Don't worry about that. Just let the person type in what they want. We're going to have a person in the back, sort of like a Wizard of Oz, who's just going to be behind the curtain and just take the printout and just go down and buy that. If the car's not possible, write the person back. We'll tell them that's not a possible car. Stop building a configurator, which is a lot of work, and we don't even need that. So I kept on having to try to convince them, stop building things we don't need just to get the answer to this test. So like on the 80th day of this 90-day period, I said, just put the site live, and let's just see what happens. So I remember on a Thursday, he put the site live, and um, I came in the next morning. I said, what happened? Did anything happen? And he says, yeah, we sold four cars. I said, hurry up and turn the site off, because we were losing $1,500 <laughs> on each car. <laughs> and I said, but it worked. People put $1,000 in for a car, sight unseen. They want the car. We'll go buy them. We'll deliver them. We'll complete the customer experience. But I think we have a yes. This is a go. I think there's a company here. And that was an example of trying to find the minimal way to just get the answer to the question, does anybody else feel like I do? Like, I wanted that, but I didn't know if anybody else would. Turned out the company was very successful. We, built, we ended up making su supplier relationships. We ended up building a full configurator. That took a lot of time. We raised money. Eventually, the company went public and was very successful. But it was just an amazing experience to try and even convince someone, just do the simplest thing to get the answer. And then I, I tried to take that away as a lesson for our other companies to always try and convince people. It's almost even if you have to write a line of code to get your answer, that's too much. Try and find your answer without writing a line of code. Sometimes you have to write code, but if you can do it without that, try, like sometimes we make mock-ups, almost like paper mock-ups or just screenshots. We, we make, we make um, drawings and put them on an iPhone just so they look like they're on the phone and they're actually just, you're looking at the photo album and you're flipping through pictures just to make it, just to see what people think. Of course, the ultimate is when you can take a credit card from someone or actually, uh, by the way, we didn't even run the cre people's credit cards through. We just needed to see that they typed in the digits of a credit card because we, we, we didn't care about the getting the $1,000. We cared about seeing would they be willing to give up $1,000 did they think they were giving up $1,000? So that's another thing. You don't even need to take the money. You just need to find out would they have done it. So that's one thing I, I would say really important for ideas is, is really test them. And then finally, listen, listen, listen. Um, uh, this is the adaptability aspect. So the more you can learn from your customers, I, I think, again, that's the, that's the core thing that you can do as a small company, as, a small, as an individual against a big company is outlisten them. So I'll give you the example with Knowledge Adventure. We were making this line of products, Dinosaur Adventure, Undersea Adventure, Body Adventure, Space Adventure. We, we, we did Space Adventure with Buzz Aldrin. We paid Buzz Aldrin a, a fee and royalties to make a product with him. We had all these great products. We were very excited. Kids loved them. Parents loved them. But they weren't selling that well. Uh, we were selling OK, but we were not profitable. And we were going to have a really tough year, one particular Christmas in 1993. We were probably going to go out of business. We were not going to make it. We had 65 people in the company. And uh, my brother, who was working with me at the company, also came up with this idea. We've got to make our numbers this Christmas. Let's start this thing called Weekend Warriors. Let's send everyone in the company out on the weekend. Everybody will get Monday off. But just for these four weeks up until Christmas, everybody take a laptop, go buy a box of donuts, bribe your way into the store at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning when they open, go set up your laptop at the end of the aisle of the kids' software, and just demo all day and sell whatever you can. And of course, we're at, when you go to a store and demo, sales would go up at that store from one product per day or two products a day to 30 products per day because you're sitting there demoing at the end of the aisle all day long. We were able to boost our revenues enough to make it through that Christmas. But every Tuesday when people came back to work after Weekend Warriors, we'd have a whole company meeting. It was about like this. And everybody would get together and tell stories, funny stories, crazy stories, whatever they learned uh, about, from, from their experience that weekend. And I got assigned to the Comp USA in City of Industry. Someone else got the Egghead on Lake Avenue. Someone got the Fries in Woodland Hills. You know, wherever it was, someone would come back with stories. And what we would find is this was a perfect example of what people would see. There would be a mom walking down the aisle, picking up the boxes in the software aisle, and looking at them, looking at the back. We even had a fold out, reading it, and then putting the product back down and walking away. And we were so frustrated that they were holding a box in their hand. They were about to buy it, and they wouldn't buy it. And we concluded. After four weeks of doing this, 
that the reason people weren't buying is they couldn't figure out if it was for their child or not. And in fact, I had always been trying to make the product for the widest age range possible. In fact, our, our products used to say for ages 8 to 108 to try and indicate anybody could learn from this. But that was actually not such a great thing. I, we didn't know that. So we said, what can we do to try and make people understand? Because there was no, there was no freemium software. There was, no, there was no way to do a try before you buy. You were in the store, the CD ROM product. Um, and we tried to come up with something that would convey to the parent that it was actually for their child. And we came up with this idea. What about if you make a product called Jumpstart Kindergarten? It would be for only one grade. It would be absolutely clear who it was for. Like a parent would look at it and go, well, that's for my either preschooler going into kindergarten, or that's for my kindergartner, give them a head start in kindergarten. And we ran this by our sales force, and they said, can't do it. It will never sell. There's only 4 million people of each age range, 4 million children of each age. So by going for such a narrow audience, you can't do that. I said, well, just take it to the resellers and see if they would do it. So they took it to a distributor. We had soft sell and narrow sell in these resellers. And they said, no, it won't sell. We can't take something that narrow. So we killed the idea. But it kept on nagging at me that this actually was what parents were looking for, something that was very specific to them. The same great idea of making kids fall in love with learning. I was really opposed to making skill and drill software. Like the other software at the time was like Read a Rabbit, Rabbit and Math Blaster. And it was all about practicing math over and over. I didn't want kids to practice math. I wanted kids to see discoveries and, and have their brain get thrilled with that, that learning moment. So I really wanted to do this. And um, uh, despite everybody objecting, we had a little Skunk Works effort in the company. We spent basically, again, $250,000 to make this product and just give it a try. We made the product. The sales force still objected. The resellers still objected. But I just made them take a production run of 10,000 units and put it in the store. And it took off like crazy. We sold 20 million copies. It took off like crazy because we eventually made the whole, the whole series. We went all the way up from kindergarten through, first, through sixth grade. We made a whole. So we basically took our old products and just broke them apart for more narrow age ranges. And this resonated with the, with the parents, exactly. So this is the uh, ultimate example of nobody told us to do this. In fact, everybody told us not to do this. But it was an insight that came from listening to our customers. And again, they didn't say it, but they were showing it with their actions. This is what a startup can do better than anybody else, can be really in contact with their, their end user and really look at what's bugging them, really look at what, what's not working, and then try and come up with the insight to make a great business. And I think that's what's so great about the startup setup and, and uh, again, a big company might not be willing to take the risk. In fact, we were almost even too big of a company to take the risk. We were too worried about cannibalizing our other revenues or too worried about rooting the relationship with our resellers. But you, you have to do that. You have to hear what the customer is saying. And acquiring complementary skills. So this comes to the execution part. Um, after I graduated from Caltech, I had a lot of friends from Caltech. I hired all of them to work with me in my business. I hired a lot of people like me. And I learned when I was 35, much too late, but it took me a while, at Knowledge Venture, that I had to start hiring some people that were not like me. I had to get a CFO. I had to get a sales guy who could get, make numbers. I had to do all these other, other different kinds of talents. And the thing I learned was that there's, uh, these, this is a, a caricature, uh, caricature of different personality types. But these different personality types exist in a company, and they need to exist in harmony. So let me tell you about these different personality types and how I think that relates to, to helping make a startup work more successfully. So there's the entrepreneurial type. Uh, that's the person who comes up with the ideas. Um, uh, and that would be the exaggeration. That's my skill primarily. I have the other skills too a little bit, but that's my main one. Then there's the producer. That's the person who has to um, actually uh, make things happen, you know, get a product out or sell it or, or uh, make, make the trains run on time. Then there's the administrator. That's the person who has to organize um, uh, everything to, to work like clockwork. And then there's the integrator that has to make those other people work together, because those other people usually hate each other's guts. Because those, those people really come from such a different mindset. And uh, the, the example I would give it would be um, if those four extreme personality types were sitting here, um, uh, and the, um, let's say there was a scratch on that window over there, the producer would look at the scratch and say, boy, there's a scratch in that window. We better fix that. And uh, the administrator would say, there's a scratch on the window. You know, we should make a form. And whenever anybody sees anything wrong, they'll fill out the form, we'll put them in order, and we'll go through them in exact order and take care of them. And the entrepreneur would look at that. You know, I would look at that scratch, and I'd say, see in that building over there? I wonder if that floor is available for rent. We could start a new business right across there. You know, wouldn't even see the scratch. We'd be looking at the horizon, not worrying about the presence. And then the integrator would look at those look and say, I wonder what those three people are thinking. Again, the exact opposite, not even looking at the scratch, just worrying about the other people. 
And I never knew that there were these other, that there, people could think the other way, because I think so much like the entrepreneur and like the producer. The administrator in me, there's no administrator in me. And I've learned how to be a little bit of an integrator to try and think about how other people are feeling. But getting a company with all of these in balance is very crucial. And no one person can be in perfect harmony in all those who'd be schizophrenic. So, so uh, getting, getting other people who you have mutual trust and respect for who have those other skills is crucial. And why it's crucial is the entrepreneur can start the company. In fact, the entrepreneur has to be there at the beginning of the company to get the thing started. But eventually, if the entrepreneur can't make anything or do anything, the company will fail. And then if it brings some P skill into the company, then it can go a little further. But then eventually it too will implode if it can't get some administrative skill, if it can't keep things efficient. And then it gets some A in the company, and then it too will fail if those people are all at war with one another. But finally, if it gets some I in the company, it can have all of them in harmony and build a long-term successful company. And I think if you look at some of the really great companies today, they do have all those skills. It's a dysfunctional company if they don't get those things in balance. Sometimes dysfunctional companies can be successful for a while, but they won't be successful for the long term. And then last of all, uh, I, we have this quote. We love this, this quote uh, so much. We have it on the wall in our building. Um, and I, my, my headline for it would be, stick with it. And it would be, it relates to very every aspect of, of, of a startup. Um, it's stick with it because the timing might not be right, like the Z.com example I gave you. If we had stuck with it a little bit longer, like if we lowered our burn rate or made it a little bit longer, we would have been successful. But also the stick with it in that you might be ridiculed. So I think every big, bold idea is a little bit ridiculed at first. So we had a company called GoTo or Overture, which invented pay-per-click advertising. That was completely ridiculed at first. Uh, Airbnb ridiculed at first. Actually, I think Facebook was ridiculed at first. Many, many great companies were ridiculed at first. Uh, if it really is a truth, it has to make it from ridicule to being self-evident. After it's ridiculed, it actually might move through a phase of being violently opposed. It starts getting opposed when it starts becoming threatening to people. Like at first it's ridiculed, nobody's worried about it. But then it actually starts being a threat, and then people start opposing it. You have to have the power to stick with something through that period of opposition till you make something actually become self-evident. If you take a new idea of yours and you take it all the way from new truth all the way to self-evident, then you truly have changed the world. And that's the most exciting thing about making a startup. That's the most exciting uh, reason why I'm here. Hopefully some of these things will help you in something you're working on. I'll be around all day, so I'm looking forward to talking to all of you and sharing other things. I'll also be able to take questions now. But um, uh, you, feel free to reach out to me. I'll do my best to get back to you on Bill at IdealLab.com. And on Twitter, I'm, I'm going around to conferences and sharing everything I learned at, at Bill underscore Gross. Uh, but first, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. That was great. Uh, we're going to take that video, I'm serious, and package it as knowledge adventure entrepreneur <laughs> and, and make it required for all of our students. Um, I want to get to questions from all of you, but let me just start with one or two myself. Uh, I'll be greedy. Uh, I've, I've had the privilege of sitting next to you with your laptop open, your giant laptop open, and your giant spreadsheet of ideas. There's, and so, right, I take it, the idea is not the most important thing, but if you don't have that, you're nowhere to start, at least. What's your worldview like, the, 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 the scratch on the window, about how you scour the world? When you look out in the world and we put on your you know, the, the sort of Google Glass, gross glass, and say, how do you look for new opportunities? What strikes you? Well, so I, I'm walking around all the time just saying, what don't I like about the way the world works? You know, ranging from traffic to airplanes to you know, the way I consume my news to I wish that someone could have told me that piece of information. That, that someone should have known that I wanted to know that. Uh, and just say, how could a technology possibly solve that? Uh, a lot of times, so that anytime I see anything that bugs me, I'll just write it down in the spreadsheet. Now, just being added to the spreadsheet doesn't mean that you can make a business out of it. Sometimes there isn't a good technological solution that will be scalable. Sometimes I can't find the people to run it. The people are the bottleneck because you can't run all these things. Uh, that's why we started Idea Market, like you said. You, you mentioned that earlier. I, I didn't bring that up. So well, we I'll get to it in a second. Yeah. I'll get to it next. Uh, yes. uh, so so um, I think for, for all of you, it's great to find something that's just personal. You wish something were a different way. And um, see if you can get a team together to tackle that. So it starts with personal frustration? It, almost always. Um, when you for see, me, for me, for you. It's for not you. the only way to come up with no, ideas. No, 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 sure. that's, that's, right, that's right, method right. one. The, do you ever say, boy, I see a company doing that, and I could do a better a, a competitive urge? Not usually. OK. Yeah. Um, well, uh, every once in a while, I see a new technology that, nice. uh, um, uh, uh, that is very cool. 
and then I say, could that be applied somewhere else to make something else better? So a new technology will also inspire you. Yes, so I'll, I'll tell you a silly one like that um, that I didn't build a company out of, but I wanted to, but um, <laughs> a, a trip to New York recently, uh, we don't have too many um, uh, High rises in Pasadena. So, so uh, I was, uh, you're going to laugh at this, but I was at, at a building here where um, when I told the security guard, uh, you typed in what floor you wanted to go to, and it sent you to the right elevator bank. There were no labels, and it, it took me right to that floor. There were no buttons inside the elevator either. So I thought, boy, that's a really interesting idea to queue people up based on some foreknowledge of where they're going. You can make these elevators much more efficient. So I was thinking, what other areas in the world could you queue people up? like that and take some information. I was trying to think maybe you could do it with parking. So maybe you could take a parking lot. And when you enter the parking lot, it would tell you to go to a specific space. It would save you time looking for the space, but also maybe the spaces could be designed around different size cars. So there could be a camera that sends SUVs to SUV spa spaces and sends smart cars to smart car spaces. Maybe you could fit more cars in the parking lot. So I was just thinking of, uh, so every once in a while I get inspired by something where I see a new thing and I say, where else could that be also empl employed? Move to our field, and, and, and the reason I ask you this is because you're not in it. Yes. And, and not to get too technical about it, but basically we're fucked. No, I, <laughs> right? I, that's the I, way I, we look at it. No, but I don't think so at all. OK, so yeah. that's where I want to go. OK, so, so take, take mobile as an example. OK. So uh, this will be the year for all of history where the total amount of time consumed uh, of content consumed on mobile will exceed consumed on desktop. And more than 50% of every web page will be viewed on a mobile device. And it's, it's going to go accelerate faster. And we're going to, as I said, 4 billion mobile devices in a few years. I think there's enormous opportunities to rethink how people consume the content, specifically on a mobile device. Everything's going to be rethought for mobile. You know, Uber is an example of a rethought, rethink for mobile. But the way we, like, the granularity of a story, the way it's displayed, the way you navigate, new ways to take into account the way the thumb is used with the phone, new ways to take into account the short time spans. I mean, so many things could be reinvented for this new medium. It, and it, it's a little bit like, uh, remember when, when uh, Edison first invest, invented the movie camera? The first thing they did was um, stick the camera in the back of a theater and film a play. Uh, no mm -hmm. cuts, no moving the camera, you know, uh, uh, no, disc, no, no new, new kinds of continuity or anything. Well, we're still pretty much in the face. It took 10 years before they took the camera out and started making cuts. People screamed when they saw trains coming at them and all the surprising things that happened when you, did, when you moved the camera around. And um, we're almost in that phase where it's only 10 year, less than 10 years since the iPhone. And uh, the idea that people haven't completely rethought the mobile experience yet, they're still mostly porting big screen down to small screen. Right. Right. So I think there are opportunities to completely rethink the, the analogy to moving the camera. Well, so my, my last question before I, I, I go out here is, is you started with relationships. And I think mobile is an important relationship machine. And when you and I have talked about this, you have a company that, that you were nice enough to involve me in uh, called Uber Media. Yes. Right, about mobile as a way to get signals and to know someone's yes. context. Yes. Does that spark any ideas of, oh, uh, of, of, uh, of news and information and informing uh, people? Absolutely. Well, people are using. Um, the signals of the mobile device in advertising, uh, where you've been, where you are at that moment, how fast you're moving, you know, are you walking, are you running, are you jogging, are you on the train or whatever. Uh, so many, the, the kind of place you're in, you know, the fact that I'm in this location right now, that GPS could determine something about me because of the very, what, what's surrounding me. There are so many things that could be tailoring content the way ads are trying to be tailored. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think people appreciate it if the ads are a little bit more targeted, but people would really appreciate it if their content were more targeted. So I think there are huge opportunities to use. Th this device that we carry around with us all the time now is an amazing sensor that is a story of our life like never before, is recording a story of our life like never before. Um, so that's got to be harnessed. All right, do we, I'm going to get you some water. You want some water? No, you're fine, okay. Um, idea market. Yes. There's a belief that, oh my god, ideas have to be kept secret because they'll be stolen. As you point out, it's more about timing and execution and so on and so forth. You held an event in Pasadena where you gave away 10, 12, 10, ten ideas. Um, and that led to ID market. Yes. That generosity and openness, I think, is important. Talk about that transition. and Because I think it's a chance for some of our businesses and students to follow that model. So for 17 years of Idea Lab's 18-year history, um, uh, we always kept the ideas very secretive. And uh, the lawyers always said, you can't post those ideas. You can't um, talk about them in public until we form the company and all that. We've got to protect the IP. We've got to do all this stuff. And then it, about a little over a year ago, I started doing the spreadsheet that I was telling you about where I was writing down all these ideas. And I was realizing I have way more ideas than we can do. 
and some of these ideas are just going to become obsolete. I convinced the lawyers at Idealab to let me just take 10 of them. Let me just take 10 ideas, and we'll just give them away. And who cares if someone else steals them? They're not, they're, we're not doing anything about them right now anyway. So we held an idea day. It was in January of this year, uh, right before we went to DLD together. Right. And uh, we uh, invited entrepreneurs from the Los Angeles area. And I just spent five minutes on each idea and shared the, sh the problem statement, you know, the thing that inspired the idea, and a possible technology way to deal with it. And um, uh, then we put them on the web afterwards. So we put up these 10 ideas and said, anybody can do them. They're yours. If you'd like to do them with us, you can pitch us on it. If you don't want to work with us, that's totally fine. If you want to pitch it to us, we might invest in you if we like you. But these are, these are free. So we got about um, uh, 50 submissions from around the world. Um, there were about 15 really good ones. And we picked four. And we funded them. So four of those 10 ideas turned into companies that have since received additional financing since then. Some of the other ones might even be being done right now. I just don't know. But they haven't contacted us. And one of them's here in New York. And I'm so thrilled that 10 things turned into four, things I wouldn't have done otherwise. And now there's 50 jobs In one created. example. One of them is called Photo Karma. Uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that I had was I, I had a problem with, with a way to uh, manage all my photos on all my different devices. And uh, I wanted some way to reduce the photos so I could find the picture I'm looking for. When I'm having lunch with someone, I want to show a photo to them. I can't seem to find it. And that's the problem. And I had a few different ideas for ways to solve it. Well, the CEO who ended up pitching us an idea has changed the company in a different direction, as, as he should, because everybody has to be passionate about the idea. So we're perfectly happy letting it shift, again, also in taking it to the market. The initial idea I had wasn't as received, well received, but the, the twist he's made was very, real, very well received. And it'll be launching in a few months, so I'll come back to you with the URL. And, and finally, you have Idea Market, which came out of that. Yes. So mention so, that so, for a So one of the um, uh, people who came to us to do the photo karma, a second person came to us to do the photo karma idea, but we already picked someone to work with on it. I said, I don't want to make another company competitive to the one we already invested. And he said, well, let's go over your other ideas. And I went over the other six. And he said, no, I don't like any of those. And I said, let's go over the other thousand. <laughs> and he said, well, you know what we really should do? We should take Idea Day and turn it into a company. So that became Idea Market. So Idea Market is a website where you can go to, and we post ideas up there. Other investors come and put money behind them, and entrepreneurs could come and pitch us to go take those ideas forward. And there again, we have uh, uh, 25 ideas now with $2.5 million behind them. And people are coming from all over the world. And that's fantastic, because now we're getting people from Cairo and from India and from London and everywhere c pitching to go do the ideas. And we'll be investing in our first teams in the next few weeks. And Bill went after his friends and said, give me ideas, give me ideas. And, uh, and Jeff. And so yeah. I put one of them in, because there's, there's infrastructure that I think is needed for local newspapers to get local merchants to be able to participate in online. And one of the bottlenecks I've learned is that, is that they don't uh, computerize their inventory. So you can't say that this item is available, this tie is available uh, down the block unless you know that it's available. So I proposed a company for that, and you've got a team yeah, so, proposing so, now. So Jeff uh, wrote that problem statement and a possible solution. We posted that at Idea Market. Um, some investors came uh, willing to back it, and then teams from around the world applied. And I think there's a team from London who's about to win the funding to go take that forward. It's been really right. exciting. Questions? Yes. Steve. Oh, next one, I'll get Steve, and then next. Okay. Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, when I buy a stock and it goes up, I don't sell it because it's going up. If it goes <laughs> down, I don't sell it because I'm losing money. How do you make that kill decision? How do you make the decision to cut off something you've put your you know, blood and best thoughts into? Yeah. That's a very good question. It is the toughest decision. And um, I'd say we've lost the most money we've lost by extending that decision too long. Meaning, eventually, the market eventually kills it for you if, it's, if it needs to be killed. But we should have killed it sooner. So how, how do we decide? Well, um, a lot of times, you're doing these tests because you have a new hypothesis for something that's going to work and turn the company around. And you want those tests to be giving you new information to continue to give you hope, almost like an uh, improving series. Um, um, if the tests are giving you less and less information, like a converging series, you know, sort of like two plus one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth, like you're learning less and less and less each time, you're never going to get out of the box. When you see that kind of converging series, you sort of know you're heading toward doom. But if you see enough signs of divergence where something's adding up and you've got a new, a new hope, I think that's a reason to continue. But when the, when, the, when the signals run out and it's converging, you pretty much know the writing is on the wall and you have to listen to that. It's very hard to do, though, especially because we get so attached to these. These are, you know, our ideas, and we fall in love with them, and we like the teams, 
uh, we're working with the people, so it's very, very hard to do. But you, you have to listen to that conver converging series. We're in a quick question quarter here, so I'll get these two and then, and then David, and then I think we'll probably be it. Yeah, is there, an, is there an idea market for journalism story ideas? Have we seen that yet? That and is a great idea. Maybe Jeff and I will do that one. <laughs> I may be discussing this yes, with you later. That is a great well, idea. Well, you also you have, you have journalists being supported by Kickstarter, journalism being supported by Patreon, which is a different kind of platform, uh, Indiegogo. Individual story ideas? Yeah, sometimes, yes. Yeah, projects, individual projects. Okay. Here and then David. Uh, hi, Peter Summer. I'm a founder and chief executive editor of Capital Intelligence Group. Last week I was with Mary Jo White and the whole Security Exchange Commission on the Jobs Act capital formation. And they made it crystal clear, this is what happened with Geithner, the Treasury Secretary, that the Jobs Act and the whole things that benefit about being able to go to the market was initially meant, and its main spirit is to provide access to capital for veterans, minority-owned, women-owned businesses to get on the market, and this is something that seems to be lost in this kind of euphoria, sort of like the dot-com days. Uh, can you address that? Why, isn't, aren't, why aren't we going back to the traditional go to your banker, get a private equity, Goldman Sachs type approach to financing new businesses? Yeah, I, I wish that some of the holdup with the Jobs Act would be resolved. I don't know what it's going to take to get there, but uh, despite that, because I think that would make things better if we could resolve that, it still is pretty easy to get capital. I don't want to make it sound like it's a walk in the park, but for some valuation, you can find um, fifty, hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars to try out something these days, and it just means you have to give up more of your idea. When I when I raised my first money for Knowledge Adventure, I raised seventy thousand dollars at a hundred seventy thousand dollar pre money valuation, so I gave up a lot of the company. But I, no one believed in that idea, and I needed the money, and then I raised a hundred thousand dollars at. $900,000 valuation from Michael Dell. He was the second investor. Still, $900,000 valuation. Again, giving up a lot of the company. So those people made out very, very well, but I'm very happy. and I, I needed the money to do it. So um, today, you could do way better than that. Uh, or, or if not, you still could do that. And you, uh, if you get a team together of people passionate about something, you could find $100,000 to do something today, and that's what's exciting. That at least gives you an at-bat to give it a try. And um, that's what's exciting about entrepreneurship right now. David? Uh, Bill, you, you, just fantastic talk. Oh, um, but with your uh, inimitable modesty, you left out something that I think you should really <laughs> talk about, which is, you know, this is a media kind of group. You pioneered what is, without question, the most lucrative business model that media has ever seen. I think you should talk a little bit about it. Oh, th th thank you, David. Well, um, <laughs> what, what was happening was, um, it was 1998. And search engines were, there were five search engine companies public already, and everybody thought that search was pretty much over. Uh, Yahoo was public, Excite was public, Lycos was public. Um, and, uh, but search was getting much worse. Like I was noticing that if you searched for the word cars, you would get cheerleading sites and even other porn results just on the word cars. Like it was absurd how bad the results were. Like four of the top 10 results were spam at Lycos in 1998, and it was because it was free. You could put any keyword you wanted on your web page, and Alta Vista and the other search engines looked at the frequency of that word on the page as a judge for whether that page was relevant or not, because that was a simplistic way of doing it in a world of no spam. That actually does work. And that was the way it's ever been done in database design and other uh, search and retrieval systems. But all of a sudden, there was this web taking off, and it was valuable to get traffic to your website, so people started spamming it. And then after they discovered that you could put keywords on the page, then people started putting white text on white background. So the word cars, 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 cars would be in the background, hidden. You couldn't see it just to try and get people to get more, more um, uh, clicks on frequent search terms. So I was trying to figure out some way to make a product that could resolve that. And I tried an editorial approach, but that doesn't scale. And I was trying other algorithmic approaches, and I didn't come up with the brilliant page rank algorithm that the Google guys came up with. But I thought, you know, maybe money would work. Maybe if you make people bid on the keyword that's relevant to them, they would only bid honestly, because there's no point in spending money for a keyword that's not relevant to you. And I remember that from my experience in my loudspeaker days, actually, when I had my stereo store. I had to pay for a Yellow Pages ad. And when, they, when I had to pay for the ad, they asked me what section I wanted to be in. And of course, I wanted to be in the audio section, not in the lawyer section or the plumber section. Why would I pay money to be in the wrong section? So that gave me the idea that maybe, well, one, paying is OK. Paying for ads around keywords was OK, as long as you disclose what's going on. 
Um, and maybe that would be a better way to organize things. So I started this idea, it was called GoTo at the time, and we decided to have a bidding system where you could bid on the word. I, I, I set the prices very low at first, it was one penny per click. So every search term was available at one penny per click, and you could bid, and then people, it was an auction, you could bid above and bid above. And um, many, many people thought that was a terrible idea. And when we first came out with it, Yahoo said they would never, ever have a par <laughs> any party to do, to do with that. Um, and um, I remember um, in the Wall Street Journal, a very negative article came out. I think Walt Mossberg said something very negative about it. I will and, confess and that Clark, I, 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 I ridiculed it to you, too. Yeah. And, and I, I really felt, and I had argued with people in our company, too. Um, but I, I said, look, as long as we're honest about it, we disclose the cost to the advertiser and tell people what's going on, I think it will actually yield better results for people because no one will ever spam and put their money on the wrong word. Um, and uh, it took off like crazy. I mean, it, it was incredible. It was making $300 million in revenue in just a few years. The company went public, had a multi-billion dollar market cap. Um, two years later, um, Yahoo said, well, maybe we'll give it a try. Uh, and then they, uh, 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 they did a partnership with us, 50-50 rev share, and then it became, made $800 million in revenue for Yahoo. So it was the number one source of revenue for Yahoo back then. And then two years later, they acquired the company. Along the way, Google came out, brilliant, brilliant page rank algorithm. And then um, they ended up copying the idea, uh, infringing on the patent, but then they acquired the patent so that they could use it. And, um, and then that led to the business model that we see today. So it, it's not, uh, it's actually, new business model needs to in, be invented because now mobile is different. People don't type in their keywords as much anymore. So I think there's a new opportunity to try and figure out how to make the new world of, of, of monetization work on mobile devices even better, and I think that's a, a, a wild and exciting frontier. But uh, David, thank you for, for uh, uh, bringing that up. But that was a perfect example of ridicule, um, uh, uh, threat, and then adoption. You know, Google adopted it eventually, Yahoo adopted it, Microsoft adopted it, everybody adopted it, but it took time. It took five years from when we first came out with it to what Yahoo finally acquired in the company. I think we have time for one more here. Sorry. Uh, Juha Kaunis, the startup on, on entrepreneur. Uh, you had great examples of business innovations. You had great examples of technology in the innovations. Uh, somewhere about content innovations. But what, from what I've, what I've seen with my work with media is that what they need to replicate the success of startups is actually a cultural innovation. We don't have sta uh, stack overflow for journalists to check what to do when someone at a crime place uh, fails to contact you or something. Uh, do you think uh, journalism and media need kind of a social or culture innovation to actually succeed? And what would that be? Yeah. Well, that's a great, great point. Uh, I can't speak to um, that cultural shift required, because I don't know the journalism culture well enough. But I can say that the culture does matter a lot to success. We are very lucky in the United States to have a culture very um, open to entrepreneurship. Um, I think the reason why we do so well is the, the failure doesn't put a scarlet letter on us like it might in some other countries. So maybe France, potentially, if you start a company and then you fail, I think a lot of people don't want to hire you again after that, don't want to give you another chance. I think in the United States, and especially in New York and California, um, if you fail, I, well, I as a hiring manager think that's a benefit. Like if I have someone who has failure in their history and has learned from it, you know, paid attention to it, like if you have failure and you don't listen to it, that's useless. But if you have failure, so that culture I think is already here in, in this room. I think the culture you're speaking to is, is all the other tools that startups have. Uh, openness. Yes, I see. About yes. Well, I think that is a um, important attribute. I think that we have a head start in that at least our culture is, um, is, is receptive to that. If that needs to be infiltrated more into journalism, maybe we can find a way to help make that happen together. Uh, Bill, I cannot thank you. Oh. oh, thank you so much. It's really, really great. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be around. I'll be around. For all, right, all, right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And I apologize to you, but he's, he's a show off, so I'm gonna, he's going to yell at me if I don't. OK, I know it is. <laughs> Give me a plaintiff look. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I, you mentioned a couple of times that most of your ideas are, are triggered by something in the world that frustrates you. And I know exactly what you're talking about. That's exactly the position I'm in. And I was wondering if you could help me get to the next level with the thing about the world that frustrates me a lot. 
Well, I would like to talk to you about the specific idea. Well, I, I, I can tell you right now. Yeah, the yeah. problem is I don't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could fix that. <laughs> that was a great setup. <laughs> I'll still talk to you about it afterwards. <laughs> All right, one, one more, one more real fast, and then we'll. I do want to go for the punch. Hi, line, Stephen Weiss. Um, yeah, I think what's one of the interesting things from your study is something that, that would really not be a surprise to anyone here, the idea that timing matters most, team execution matters second, and the truth that you're revealing is only the third most important thing. For journalists, that happens all the time. Look at all the people, for instance, on the Bill Cosby story. So, but when you see a culture, you have a corporate culture or a, an industry culture that actually really embraces the ethos that you're saying is important. So when you, when you see a bunch of people who do that every day in their jobs, but they're not doing the innovation that you're talking about in terms of their corporate innovation, what's the problem there? Well, I think that structure does matter. And I think that the startup structure does encourage, it, it, it actually unlocks human potential. So I think taking people and putting them in a situation where they have a high equity stake, or even any equity stake, but like once you give people 1% of something, and they have 1% 1 as a magic number. I mean, it's not a magic number. So I'm using it as an example. Um, when, when employees have a 1% stake, it's not only they think that that is maybe going to make them rich later on. It's that they are an important shareholder that has a say in how things go. And it makes them stay up at night and look for new things and look for new ways to get things done. And that causes innovation. So um, how to get that? Well, I think if, it's, if, it's, if the context is to try and have it happen inside of a big corporation, then corporations, I think, need to try and find new ways to equi equitize people or new ways to organize people. Or lots of accelerators and incubators are around to try and take people and put them into teams where they have that high personal stake that actually unlocks the human potential. But I do think there's actually a true unlocking of human potential that occurs when you organize people properly in a startup. And it's hard, you can't replicate that just by telling people to do it. Like it has to, it, it's like what happens in a, a baseball team that works together really well. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a team fact or, or a team of people working on a play together. There's just a camaraderie and a um, supporting of other people that just gets unlocked that didn't exist before. Do you have hope for old companies being able to have that or you're, you're, just, you're in startup mode? Well, I think old companies have to do, have to create that in very innovative ways, often with skunk works or often with new structures, phantom equity, all kinds of different things. I don't think it just will happen naturally. Like you have to work at it. All right, Bill, I cannot thank you enough. This is just, just great. Thank you. So.